All right, I think we're live now. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for another session with WebCEF S. So today we're joined by Dr. Ruby Sharania, a general dentist. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ruby. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Great. Firstly, I'd like to thank Dr. Park for setting this up. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here speaking with you all. Dentistry is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So it's really great to have the opportunity to speak to you all from all corners of the world about something that I love. So we'll go ahead and begin. Firstly, my name is Dr. Ruby Acharanya, but most of my patients know me as Dr. Ruby. And I am a practicing general dentist from New Jersey, USA. So what we're going to discuss tonight is a bunch of things. Firstly, we're going to talk about my experience as a pre-dental college student, essentially what many of, many of you are going through now. So I'll discuss what my experience was like in hopes to inspire you all to continue on with your journeys. We'll also talk about how I had decided to go for a master's degree prior to applying to dental school and the reason as to why. Then we'll talk about the application process to dental school and what that process was like for me to give you guys some tips. Then we'll talk about my dental school experience. I'll try and bullet point and highlight for you as much as I can in terms of what that was like for me. And then I'm going to briefly touch on community service because I think dentistry goes far beyond the reach of just doctor patient relationship. It's really truly about making a difference in your community and really improving the oral health of everyone in the community. And then we'll also talk about my residency experience because prior to working, I had made the decision to go for a one year general practice residency to gain more exposure and experience. Then we'll talk about my decision to specialize or not and how I came to that decision. And then I'll talk about where I am now, what I am doing, and then I'll leave you off with some dental pearls, which are essentially tips and essentially inspiration for you all to continue on with your journeys. All right, so let's talk about my not so glamorous life as a pre-dental college student. I attended Rutgers University in New Jersey. I had majored in biology and minored in psychology. And like most of us, I said I wanted to go into dentistry because I wanted to help people. So I went ahead and started with the basic science coursework, which I'm sure all of you are taking a version of. So that includes your bio, your chem, your biochem, your organic chem. And we all know how tough and difficult it can be to get through some of these courses. So I kind of want to advise you all on something that I think I realized much later in my journey. And that is that your experience in these courses may not be the best and that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're not going to succeed as a dentist. It doesn't mean that you're not going to succeed as a dental school student. It's truly just a learning process and a way of you learning what works in terms of studying and what it is that you need to do to prepare yourself for that part of your life. So again, I had to learn how to study. And in the beginnings, that was a little bit tough for me. So much so to the point that I actually barely passed organic chemistry. That is just that one course that I just truly struggled with. And I remember after the end of that semester, I went and I spoke with my academic advisor about you know, my, my struggle and how badly I wanted to get into dental school. And she basically told me that I wouldn't get in and to pursue another career path. I went home, I cried, woke up the next day and you try harder and you go harder because honestly, as long as you persist, there's nothing that you can't accomplish. So after I started taking more of these courses, I decided, you know what, let me go ahead and try and shadow a dentist so I can start getting some real exposure to the field. So that's something that I really encourage you all to do if possible. I know with COVID right now, it's very difficult to get that kind of experience, but if and when the world permits, I do recommend you shadow someone because then you get to see firsthand what being a dentist really truly is like. So for me, I had this opportunity with my mom's general dentist. She was a super inspiring female, had a family, was doing great work for the community, and I really truly just wanted to be like her. So it was really great to get that exposure to the dental field in that experience. So I wrapped up college and I graduated and then I decided to take the DAT, which in the US is the admission exam that you take 
prior to applying to dental school. I took the test and I got a good, but not a great score. And so I said, you know what, let me try and see what happens. Let me apply to some schools. So I replied to four schools. I interviewed at all four and got rejected from them. And that allowed for the realization that I need to try harder and to become more of an outstanding applicant. So in order to do so, I went ahead and considered this master's program. This allowed for a couple of things. This allows for you to gain more exposure to different aspects of dentistry, such as research. And it also allows for you to improve your GPA, which here is your grade point average, which has to be fairly high in order for you to stand out as an applicant. And it also just gave me more background and knowledge. So I attended the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, which now in the US is known as Rutgers Medical School. And I did a master's of biomedical science. It is a two year program. I'm unsure if in wherever you are and what country you're in, if there's a version of this where you can go ahead and take courses in the medical sciences of different sorts to gain more experience and exposure. Because I think that this was a great way for me to really truly be exposed to all my options. So I gained experience in the field of dental research, which is not something you really come across on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I had a chance to work on the crystallization of a salivary amylase protein from the bacterium we know as Staph aureus, which is found in the oral cavity. So we were able to basically crystallize this protein, salivary amylase, and put it through a machine for x-ray diffraction and structural analysis. By the time I was done with my research, we were able to get a crystal, which was really exciting. And unfortunately, I was just finishing my program. So I'm not sure what happened after the fact, but it was really, really an, an, a really fun experience to go through. And then I finished the program by graduating honors because I just tried my absolute best to study harder and to just to really commit myself to doing well and standing out as an applicant. So I think the take home here for all of you is it's, it don't be discouraged. It's going to be a hard journey, but so long as you continue to try hard and strive, you will accomplish what you set your heart to. So again, I decided that in doing so, not only what was I able to be more academically confident, but I mastered how to study better. All right, so now let's talk about my application process. I actually finished that two-year program that I've just mentioned to you in 1.5 years. So I had a six-month gap where I had the opportunity to restudy for the admission test, the DAT, and also reapply to dental school. So I took a very bold move of applying to only three schools that I really truly saw myself at, and that was UMDNJ, NYU, which is New York University, and Boston University. When deciding what schools you want to go to, no matter what, what part of the world you're in, there's a couple of things you can do to try and gear yourself towards where you find yourself. Those include utilizing resources such as your colleagues. If you know anyone, especially in these days with social media, it's very easy to connect with someone and ask questions. Try to find a colleague who's already in dental school to try to gain insight and see if that's a school you can see yourself at. You can also use guidebooks. You know, in the US, we have something called the ADEA's Official Guide to Dental Schools. So this provides a lot of information in terms of statistics about what score you need, what grade point average you need in order to get into a certain school. So I compiled a list using all these statistics and information and then cut it down to three. And Another thing that I that I hope one day you guys can do is visit the schools because doing so allows for you to really truly feel to see if it's somewhere you can see yourself at. So I interviewed with a better grade point average and a better admission score. And then I got waitlisted at all the schools in the late spring of 2012. Then I still remember to this day, I was sitting in my room in August of 2012 and I got a call. And they said, hey, we have a spot open. Would you like to come? And I said, absolutely. And then I asked, when do I start? And they said, in a week. So that was the craziest week of my life. I had to pack my entire room into boxes in one week and drive up four hours to Boston from New Jersey. 
And it was such a fulfilling week and experience. Uh, so again, I accepted this offer and I was especially excited because Boston University here had this intimate classroom setting that I think was very ideal for me. The more intimate the setting, the better, because then you get to really get hands-on training from your faculty and, and, and your teachers and professors. And you also feel like it's a little bit more of an approachable environment. So finally, I'm in. So we start off our dental school experience with this really nice ceremony. It's a pinning ceremony where essentially, you know, they welcome you in and they tell you that you're going to be embarking on this wonderful journey that's going to be lifelong. So the next week you start off with your courses all over again. So once you're done with your anatomy and your biochem and microbiome, don't think it's over because it's going to come back and it did. So I had to take these courses for maybe the second or even third time at this point. Um, but again, these were a little bit more geared towards the head and neck and the biology that actually is applicable to the field of dentistry. So that to me was quite um, different because then at, the, at that point, you know that you're studying for a, a, a specific reason. So you have to learn effective time management. And this is something that's going to carry yourself into your dental career, because as any other practicing dentist will tell you, time is everything. You have to know how to manage your time and use it efficiently. So this is something you learn early on with your studying habits early on in your dental school career. And our dental school in particular, we also had a chance to start doing things in the simulation lab where we have the handpiece, the drill, as you all know, that we use for dentistry, and we have a mannequin. So we begin by doing the amalgam, which you all know as the silver fillings, just to get used to how to position the patient, how to hold the lighting, and all the different nuances involved in it. So it's really, truly a nice and exciting time because you're learning to how to really, truly be a dentist. And then you also start going to dental conventions in dental school, which is great because it's almost like the Disney world of dentistry. You go to this convention where there's all sorts of dentists and you're learning about the newest equipment and materials and you're taking courses. And that's where you really truly find others who are just as passionate about dentistry as you are. So then year two happens and you're starting to get a lot more of that simulation lab experience. In my school in particular, we had the opportunity to do all parts of dentistry in the simulation lab in that second year. So we were doing fillings. We were learning how to make dentures, which is known as removable prosthodontics. We were learning how to make crowns and bridges, which is what we call fixed prosthodontics. And then you begin to study something that we call occlusion which is essentially how your teeth meet. And this is very important from the functional standpoint for your dentistry for the remainder of your career. So it's very important that you master this skill. You do this other really exciting thing called Stab Lab where you and your friends get to numb each other up. And it's the first time you're using a needle and you're trusting your friend to do a good job. So it's an exciting time and you're really learning what it's like to truly practice these dental skills. You also learn about periodontal disease and how to assess for it and what we call gum health, right? So you're using a probe to measure, measure pocket depths and assess for what is gingivitis and the different kinds of periodontitis. You also in your second year take your boards. So here in the US, there's various boards you have to take. The first is the NBDE, which is the national state board, or sorry, the national board. And this consists of two parts, one part that you take after your first two years, and then the second part you take after your second two years. So all the material that you've covered in your first two years of dental school will be in that part one of that exam. And then whatever you take in the latter half of your dental school career will be on that second exam. And then you get to celebrate a little bit with a white coat ceremony, which is essentially initiation into the clinic. So year three is where you're wrapping up a lot of those didactic courses, meaning a lot of your studying is, is starting to come to a close and a lot of your clinical practice begins. So you're just as busy, but it's a different kind of busy. So you begin seeing patients and you learn about treatment planning. Treatment planning is essentially a plan that you make for your patient by assessing for both hard tissues, such as the teeth and soft tissues, such as the gums and you formulate for the patient a plan to keep them 
stable in their oral health. You also in this time get to assist colleagues and learn the tips and tricks from them. You also get to assist clinicians that are specialized. For example, if there is someone in your school that is in the oral surgery program or in the endodontic program, you get the opportunity to watch their work and see what it is that, that they do and see if it's something that interests you after you're done with dental school. And there's tons and tons of lab work. So here in the, in, in, in the US, we have requirements in terms of how many crowns we need to make, how many dentures we need to make, and so on and so forth. So in the lab, you're learning how to pour up your own models so that you can study the patient's teeth and bite and also fabricate for them a good crown or bridge or denture. Then in your fourth year, you start to do a lot more clinical practice that's a lot more streamlined with what you're going to do after graduation. And by that, what I mean is you get to go to a health center and basically be the general dentist there under supervision of, of, a, of a mentor essentially at that health center. So you'll be able to see patients on a day-to-day -day basis and perform the bread and butter dentistry, but have the comfort knowing that someone is there to help you and guide you so that you don't feel like you're on your own in case you are in a hot spot. So in this last year, you also have the opportunity to finish all your graduation requirements, which we just talked about, and then take that second part of that examination, which I just mentioned to you. Now, another aspect of licensure that we have to do in the US is a license exam. And this depends on the region of the US that you live in. There is the, the, the NERB, which is for the Northeast primarily and some other states. And then there's the REB, which is for the West. So in the, in the Northeast, we take the NERB and that has two parts to it. There's a written exam, just like you did for your boards. And then there's also a clinical aspect to it where you're doing a filling, a deep cleaning on a patient and you are under the watch and also essentially judgment of a panel of dentists. So they'll assess your work and make sure that it is clinically competent and proficient in order for you to attain your licensure. So as long as you pass that exam, you are qualified to apply with your state for a license as a dentist. So after that, you have to start thinking about what it is that you want to do after you graduate. And there's a couple of options. Either you can specialize, you can go into a general practice residency, or you can go straight to work. So there is flexibility and options in terms of what it is you'd like to do. And then finally, before you know it, the day comes that you graduate and it is the most fulfilling feeling when you know that you finished all your requirements and everything is good to go for, for you to start your career. So now I just briefly want to touch on community service because as I mentioned, there's nothing better than giving back to the community. And to me, that is the true essence of our profession. And for me, I had the opportunity to participate in different kinds of community service. So if you guys are able to find something similar and where you're at or where you're living, I highly recommend it. And you don't even have to be a dentist here in the US to do this. So this included things such as oral health education for school-aged children, such as teaching them how to brush their teeth, how to floss, what it means to brush for two minutes. So learning and instilling these habits in young children early will allow for them to have good habits when they grow up. Then we also do things such as oral cancer screenings for the underserved population, because this is the part of the population that does not get the access to healthcare that the rest of us do. So if there is something going on that is of concern, they're unaware of it unless we bring it to their attention. So this gives you that chance to really let them know if there's anything that's going on that they need to have seen or taken care of. Then finally, I had the chance to do some dental kit packaging. And it's just really nice because there's a lot of homeless people out there here in the US that truly don't even have toothbrushes to use. So this is a great opportunity to just go out to the community and hand these things to them so that they're able to maintain some kind of oral health. And from what we know and what studies show, there is a link between your oral health and your systemic health. Things such as heart disease are linked to periodontal disease. So it's very important that we maintain oral health and they deserve that much of a chance. So I encourage all of you to partake in events in your community if and when possible. All right, let's talk about residency. 
So even with all the hard work you put into accomplishing your goals in dental school, you only really truly learn dentistry with experience and time. And this is the thing that's so beautiful about dentistry. You're a lifelong student and there's always so much to learn. So a lot of states in the US, including New York and California, require a residency before being able to attain your licensure and practice in those states. I highly recommend everyone does at least a one year residency if possible in your country, because it is the best way for you to jumpstart your career. I had the chance to do a residency in the Bronx, New York, and it was a wonderful hybrid of day to day dentistry. So I was doing my fillings, my root canals, my crowns during the day. And I had a surgical slash emergency on call experience where I was on call with the oral maxillofacial team in handling dental trauma. So I also had the chance to rotate through many other aspects of dentistry, such as pediatrics, oral surgery, as I mentioned, anesthesiology, and even special needs, because that is another subset of the population that is underserved and does not get the proper treatment that they deserve to have. So it was really truly fulfilling to have the chance to provide this for them. So one thing that you got, I got really comfortable doing and that you get to have comfort doing in a residency is things such as fixing chipped and fractured teeth, draining swellings, repairing lacerations, meaning cuts that you get to your lip, your tongue, and various areas of the mouth. And it's a very, very, very busy time. There were weeks where I was working at least 80 hours and it was incredibly exhausting, but also so fulfilling because this accelerates your experience, your exposure, your efficiency, and your confidence as a dentist. To specialize or not to specialize. I personally decided to become a general dentist because I love meeting patients of all ages with all sorts of needs. It keeps my days exciting and different but everyone's goals are different. So for me, the goal is to own a practice where I can be that trusted general dentist to the community. But if you are considering a specialty, I recommend you seek advice either from your school or your local dental professionals in whatever field it is that you're interested in. What kind of job do I want? So there, again, there are all sorts of options once you've graduated from dental school here in the US. So for me, I began practicing in Central and North Jersey. There are various styles in terms of how you can have your practice, but there are essentially four types that you'll see all around. The first is a Medicaid office. This is essentially insurances that the state provides to those who do not have enough income or are older or under Medicare. And these offices tend to be very problem focused because these patients usually come in with pain as they may not have the means to access a healthcare provider. Then there's also the private practice. Now this is essentially the standard dental office with standard insurances as, as we have here in the US and you're providing that comprehensive dental treatment. There are also corporate offices. This is almost like having a chain of, of, of one name all throughout the state or country. So these offices tend to be more fast paced and comprehensive with a managerial assistance. So your admin and financial aspects of the office are handled through a third party company. And then there is your fee for service, which is where patients essentially pay out of pocket for whatever treatment it is that they need. And that tends to have a lot more of an experience focus to it. So when it's time to decide what type of job you would like to have, there's a few things that I think you should consider. The first is how far is this job from, your, from where you live and what your hours are going to be like. And I say this because if you're going to travel far away, you want to ensure that you're going to have the means and the, the ability to show up to work on time every day and consistently show the same level of work because it can get tiring. And if you feel you cannot show up to your 100%, then it may not be the right fit for you. You want to make sure that the job makes sense. The other thing is that you want to consider if there's mentorship or guidance. 
It's not easy to find, and I am truly thankful to have the ability to have some sort of guidance, even as a practicing dentist. There's all sorts of tips and tricks that you can learn along the way from another dentist that you may not have had otherwise if you're just working by yourself. It's also important to take note of what procedures you're going to be doing. It's great to play on your strengths and the things you'd like to do after dental school, but you also want to have a chance to grow on your weaknesses. So this is a conversation to be had with whoever it is that you're going to end up working for. And for me, the most important thing is growth potential. You want to have professional growth and growing as a dentist, as well as financial growth. Especially here in the US, we have surmounting dental school costs and it's becoming very costly. So it's important that's something that you consider when you graduate. You will be more aware of what type of practice you want to have, uh, work for and what job suits you with time and experience. I first started off in a very fast paced office, but eventually found myself where I am more happy and more confident. And that's in a private and a fee for service office. All right, now we get to talk about some fun stuff. So here are some cases. The first one I have here on the left side is a patient who had congenitally missing lateral incisors, meaning that she was missing her side teeth that are in, from the front since she was born. So she, this was in my residency, residency program. So she had gone through orthodontic treatment to realign the teeth and then implants were placed. Now, when I got to see her was after the implants were placed and they, they had healed. At this point, she was going to get crowns on the teeth, which is what I was going to provide for her. So we went through taking photos and having communication with the lab because that is incredibly important, especially when you're working on front teeth. You wanna make sure you provide the lab with as much information as possible so that you can get a great result. So you can see in the after photo here, it looks pretty natural and she was so incredibly happy. I remember I handed her the mirror after I had inserted the crowns and I was nervous because I didn't know how she would react. She hadn't had teeth there her whole life. And she saw the mirror and she started crying and I didn't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing. But then she smiled soon after that and she was very happy. And then I was relieved to know that she was happy with it. So on the right side here, we have a small video of me extracting a tooth. So this is after we have luxated the tooth a little bit, meaning that we have created some space between the bone and the tooth so as to create some glide movement with our forcep here to remove the tooth. So I'm going to show that. And you can see the infection comes out right with it. Pretty nice, huh? So it's fairly common to find teeth like this where an, an, an infection will be attached to the tooth like so. And when it is, it's pretty, it's pretty nice for us to actually see the infection. After the fact, we go back into the tooth socket to make sure that we do what we call curatage. You wanna make sure you remove all of that infected tissue if there's any residual tissue left and you irrigate the socket well in order to make sure that there is, there is healing that is nice and healthy. So we have another tooth here on the left. This is a wisdom tooth. Here in the US, we number we have the uh, numerical system one through one through 32. So this is number 17, the lower left wisdom tooth. And as you can see, it's a pretty broken tooth. And it is in a position that's a little bit tight. So I had to be very careful when luxating this tooth with my elevators, because if I rush this case, as you can see, the top portion of the tooth here is, is pretty brittle. So I have to make sure I get down to solid tooth structure with my elevator to make sure that I'm very nicely, slowly uh, luxating between the tooth and the bone right there and creating enough space so that I can grab my forcep and almost passively remove it without too much force. Because if you apply too much force, the tooth could break. So with slow and steady movement, I was able to get the tooth out in one piece, which you could see right here in the, in the photo right next to it. And here on the right side, I have another 
photo of a fairly large infection attached to an extracted tooth. I have not seen anything that big ever, and I was so excited that I had to take a photo of it. Um, you can see that the infection is almost right at the furcation of the tooth, and it was pretty large. So I think the, the bacteria probably spread quickly and quite extensively in that area. So it was something very, very interesting to see. All right, now I'm gonna leave you guys with some dental pearls. These are just little bits of inspiration that I think have helped me along the way and hopefully will help you guys too. So the first is that dentistry can be very challenging at times and can really test your patients, whether it's a fearful, anxious patient or something that's complicated. But these experiences will teach you good character. There's nothing like dentistry because it teaches you so much patience and mindfulness. If you're not mindful of a certain case, if you're not mindful of how a patient will be, you will ultimately end up finding yourself not succeeding as you would if you were mindful of certain things. So this is something that really truly comes in your path and your career with dentistry. The other thing is that balance is key as a dentist. Schedules can become very hectic and busy but it's also important to give yourself time and your loved ones proper time and maintain that balance. And again, the road might not be smooth and there may be many obstacles along the way, but persistence and hard work is absolutely key in order for you to accomplish your goals. And dentistry, like I said, is lifelong, lear lifelong learning, whether it is clinically or personally. So embrace this journey and enjoy it along the way. And I'm going to leave you guys with one quote, which I love so much, and it's that, Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And the point is to say is really, it comes down to how hard you work. Thank you all for having me. It was a pleasure to speak. Thank you, doctor. That was an amazing presentation. No problem. It's my pleasure. All right. So we have a few questions for our Q&A session and I'll just start with mine. <laughs> sure. Or would you like to share your social media first? Um, yeah, whatever. So I just have my contact here in case anyone has any questions even after the session. You can send me a message at Dr. Rubia on Instagram or email me at rubyc.dmd at gmail.com. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I have a few questions and I'm pretty sure other people do. So I'll just start with mine. Okay. And my first question is regarding shadowing since you also shadowed your mother. So do you have any shadowing tips? And as a dentist, like, what do you think are good questions to ask during shadowing? Yeah, these are really great questions. So I would say, don't be afraid to ask questions. I do remember being a little timid when I was shadowing because, you know, you don't want to interfere or, or bother the doctor so much when, you know, they're doing the work they have to do, which is fine. But when time allows for it, either before or after the procedure, do take the time to ask questions about how it is that they did a certain procedure, why they decided to use a certain material, or even things from like the patient management standpoint, which are things that I don't think I was very attentive to until I myself became a dentist. Because it's really about alleviating patient fears. If you think about it, it, it patients come in with a level of anxiousness. You're working in their mouth. It's not a comfortable thing. So you have to be able to make them feel comfortable and at ease. And this is not something that I realized until after the fact. So I would like if someone asked me, if, if someone was shadowing me, like, so how did you decide to alleviate this patient's fears? Or why did you work at a certain pace with this patient um, versus another, you know? Because it, it's, it's also something that you have to tailor from patient to patient. So questions about patient management is something that I definitely think I wish I had asked. And I would hope that someone would ask me if they were shadowing me. Thank you. Yeah. So the next question is, so after you got rejected to dental schools, where did you find that motivation to stick with uh, dentistry and just keep moving forward? I couldn't see it any other way. There was no option for me. You know, it's kind of like what Michael Jordan says, the only option is to win, you know, and you, you really got to keep that mentality because if you give yourself any other option, you're bound to not fail, but it's going to be a, cur a curvy road for you. If you only see one end goal, you will get there. Even if it's through a detour, you will get there. So for me, it was really truly about just seeing that as the only option and making sure I did whatever I had to to get there. 
Wow. <laughs> okay. My next question is, like, did you, so this also relates to anxiety, but did you not feel anxious when you applied to only three schools? Because you said that it was a very bold move. And even when I was, so this is personal, but even when I was applying to colleges, I applied to like 11 to 13 schools. <laughs> so did you not feel anxious at all? Absolutely. I was incredibly nervous about it. And I told myself, you know, I gave myself a plan B, a plan C. And I said, if I didn't get in, I would try again. If it was taking another admission exam, if it was taking another course, a curriculum of some kind, if it meant shadowing a dentist or working part time somewhere, I, I try to give myself options that would be a means to getting to that same goal. You know, it, it may not work out smooth sailing. You may not get there, you know, in, in the timeline that you want to get it there in, but you will ultimately get there if you just find ways to get there. So this is a continuation from my previous question. So what made you choose dentistry? Because like, see, like listening to you, I feel your passion and like you're motivated to this field. So how did you get into it? Yeah. So as I mentioned, my mom, right, she went through a lot of dental trouble. She had moderate to severe periodontal disease. And I saw the, the toll that it took not only from the physical standpoint, right, the oral health, like she, has tr she had trouble eating, right. But then I also saw the emotional component. You know, we really truly underestimate the role that your teeth and your oral health play on a person's being, you know, their ability to smile, their ability to speak, their ability to eat, right? These are all day-to-day -day things that you do. So seeing it on a personal level with my own mother is what incited that passion because I wanted better for her. And as soon as I saw that I wanted better for her, I wanted better for anyone that I treated because I treat everyone the same as if they were my mom in the chair. And to this day, that's the same mentality that I still have. That is so sweet. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me ask you a question about money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a program called an uh, intern in Korea, South Korea, which is not mandatory, but you we can run by practicing in various departments after graduating from dental school. Yeah. We usually work on a small salary, you know, uh, thirty thousand uh, dollars per uh, month. How about um, how about US? Do you pay for your residence or paid? Very good question. So I have to say uh, your residency salary is very similar to what you're explaining, Dr. Park, in terms of being an extremely small and limited salary. It's essentially mm -hmm. enough to just live paycheck to paycheck. So I had to live very frugally in that year. You know, there I, I'll be honest, there were days where I was packing myself peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunchtime, right? So you live frugally, but it's a small sacrifice in the grand scheme of things. And even after the fact, Dr. Park, like when I first started working as an associate, it here in the US, um, it varies in terms of your compensation model, right? So there's usually a base pay and that can vary. You know, the average is around $500 a day. And then you usually get a percentage of collections. And that collections depends on what the insurance reimburses us after the procedures have been done, right? So. And every practice has a different model in terms of how they reimburse for that or how they'll, how they'll pay the associate dentist for that. So it took me a lot of learning in terms of how that compensation model works in order for me to see what works best and how I'd be able to save. Because student loans, graduating from BU, full disclosure, I walked out of Boston University with $500,000 in debt. So that's a lot of money. And I have to make sure that I am saving so as to minimize how much of a toll I'm going to take with interest because there's interest compounded on top of that principle. So for me, it was $60,000 in my residency year for the year. And then starting off, you can start off in the 80, 90 range, and then you kind of build yourself up from there. And again, it depends on the compensation model of the office. And even the practice style, you know, some, some patients pay up front and then they get reimbursed by insurance. And this is more of an assurance for us because we know we're getting our collections up front and we have the ability to then, you know, guarantee ourselves a certain pay. So it gets very tricky and very complicated. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no Can problem. I ask one more question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you showed us a video clip of Premolar extraction yes. by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm wondering that uh, how much uh, is that dental treatment in US? Uh, in South Korea, it is uh, ten one hundred dollars per Premolar extraction. Okay. Yeah, here oh, it depends. So if you're going to a general dentist versus a specialist the cost is going to be quite different. So here mm -hmm. we don't charge by tooth, we charge by the nature of the extraction. There is a code for simple extraction and then there's a code for a surgical extraction. So the range in most offices here for a surgical extraction is around $350. Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> So my next question is compared to other parts of the US, what are like what do you think are the big features of practicing in the northeastern part of the US? The Northeast is a very hustling and bustling type environment, right? Um, you know, when you picture the Northeast, you picture New York and you picture people that are on the go all the time. And that's very much true of most of the Northeast. You know, People are go-getters and they're very fast paced, right? So you'll find that that'll kind of reflect on the offices you work in. You know, They're pretty quick paced, very fast paced, and they're usually very busy, you know? Um, and, you, and again, time management is so important because you know people have a set amount of time they set in their day off of work or off of whatever they're doing. And you wanna make sure that you're seeing people in a timely manner and making sure you give them the proper attention and care they need. So I definitely see in the Northeast more of a hustle and bustle type environment compared to the rest of the US. Thank you. Um, so we have a question in the chat saying, um, did you do research with the professor during your undergraduate years? So I only did research in my postgraduate. So when I was getting my master's and I was under a mentor, basically he was overseeing the project and I was essentially just helping to provide the method for him, right? As I mentioned, crystallizing the protein for x-ray diffraction. So uh, he was overseeing the entire project and all the other various aspects of it. I was just there to gain exposure of how to work in a lab for a dental reason, you know? Um, pipetting and stuff you would never tie to dentistry so this this had this this was the opportunity for me to link the two and figure out how that really works so regarding getting your first job did you ever think of moving to a very distant place so like california you know i did i did consider it and um you know we don't know what, where life will take me. And it's possible that I may end up out of the Northeast in a very different kind of setting, maybe in the South. And so for me, starting in the Northeast was just my stepping stones, you know? Like I said, I see the goal in mind, right? The practice ownership that I wanna have. And even if it's a detour, I still know that that's my end goal. So I'm going to get there, even if it's in the South, if it's in the North, wherever it is, it, the goal is to make that happen. And then we have another question in the chat saying, could you describe your undergraduate stats, such as like DAT, GPA, extracurriculars, and how that translated to which dental school you applied to? Sure. So I can't quite remember the details of my admission score, um, but I do remember that it was on a scale of average, above average, and then excellent. So when I first took the, the, the exam, I was above average, but then that second time around, I got in the excellent range. And then when I took the, uh, my grade point average, graduating out of my undergrad, I think it was around average or a little bit above average. But then when I did my master's program, I actually got here, it's straight A's, like, you know, like a 4.0. So I got a perfect score essentially in my master's program. And that added on to my undergraduate score to increase that, that, that number. So it looked even better. And they were also able to see that because I most recently was in that master's program and did so well, they could see that I was better at studying and that I knew what I was doing. 
So during your undergrad years, I saw that you minored in psychology, right? Yeah. Do you think that has helped a lot or what do you think? Absolutely. Because I think that in doing so, I was able to gain exposure to, you know, us humans, there's various aspects to us, right? There's our physical health, there's our mental health, right? So you're not treating just a mouth, you're treating a human, you're treating a whole human being. And so psychology gives you this opportunity to see and understand fears and stressors and triggers, especially when it comes to special needs, patients who have anxiety, you know, a lot of patients associate dentistry with a trigger to their anxiety. So it's very important to understand these and know how to manage this. So psychology was a wonderful exposure and a wonderful way for me to really truly understand this. Um, so what is one challenging aspect of general dentistry? So I think the one challenging aspect is trying to maintain balance. Um, that's because you can get so set on wanting to do 100% and stay that extra hour at work and see what extra patient and, you know, you, it becomes incredibly tiring. So striking a balance, I think, is something that I can sometimes slip up on and I'll catch myself because I'll be a little bit tired. And then it does a disservice to the patient because you want to be able to show up and give them that 110%. And by being a little bit balanced and structuring your schedule in a way where you are able to see everybody and give them your 100% without being overly worked or burnt out does a service to both you and them. So striking that balance, I think, can sometimes get a little bit tricky. But as long as you can find the right, the sweet spot, then I think you're good to go. Thank you so much. Um, I just have one last question. This, so you talked a lot about time management during your dental school years and even when you're like practicing. So did you have, do you have any tips about time management? Do, did you like keep a planner? Yes, I am actually very big on planners. I am very big on organization. And this goes with organizing your schedule, but this also comes with being prepared. So for example, in the beginning of the day, before we get started on anything, we have something called a huddle with our staff. So the office manager, my assistant, the hygienist and myself will meet and look at the schedule. We'll see step-by-step step all the patients that are coming for the day so that if there's anything that we need to be aware of in terms of managing patient anxieties, if a patient needs extra time, we're ready for it. And then even from the ergon from the standpoint of having your instruments, instrumentation, your armamentarium ready, we make sure we have everything out and ready to go for each patient. If there's a certain material that we need to take out, we make sure it's ordered and ready to go because this will make it a lot easier doing the procedure for you to do things efficiently. Because if you have to stop, look for something or go grab somebody, it's going to take time. And again, it's not gonna be as efficient. So we always make sure we're ready to go for the day every day. That was so helpful. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, uh, Yeah, I totally agree with you. The dentist on treatise only day three patient. Uh, I, I'm very interested in psychology too. You know, uh, I'm a surgeon. Uh, would it help if I learn psychology now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and you're right. You know, and I think it's something that over time and experience, we see more, or there, we see certain nuances or certain things, you know, that, that you may not have seen otherwise, right? So I guess having that preparedness for it in, in your career, no matter what stage it's in, it's, it's super helpful. Thank you very much. I will. Good. <laughs> so I think that's all the questions that we have for today. If Sonu could turn off the list. So thank you everyone for joining us through YouTube. And thank you, Dr. Ruby. It's an absolute pleasure. And it was so great to meet all of you guys. If you guys ever need anything, please don't hesitate. Reach out to me. Thank you so much. No problem. Take care.